Wednesday, uh, we become church, uh, doing our weekly uh, live stream and Bible study. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to continue from where we left off, but I'm going to open up in prayer um, and let my wife uh, get started. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for protecting and watching over us and keeping us safe throughout the night. We pray for this holiday time as many people are traveling and on the roads. We pray that you would keep them safe, bring them safely to their destination, and help them to have a good time with family and friends and loved ones. I pray you keep us all safe, bring us safely home again. And I pray for this lesson as we uh, discuss anxiety, you would help us to learn those things that you would have us to learn and, and to, to properly deal with anxiety and view it the same way you do. And I pray you would help each one, each person that views this and us as we teach it to truly uh, model uh, and become the people that you would have us to be. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so everyone has their Bibles. We're in Matthew chapter 6. Um, last week we did 19 through 24. So this week we're going to pick it up at 25. And it's probably going to be a three-part series on the anxiety. We'll see how it goes. Um, today's lesson also might be a little bit shorter. Um, because we kind of want to stick to the segments that we have. So we're going to be Matthew 6. Uh, whoever's flipping or clicking, and starting at 25, uh, we're doing 25 through 34. Did you want to read? Oh, okay. You need to. So uh, Matthew chapter 6, uh, a brief start, starting at uh, 25. Through 34, this is the New King James Version. We're using a Bible gateway. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubic to his stature? So, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say, I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall I eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows knows that you need these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Thank you. Um, so tonight we're probably just going to be going through 25 through 27, um, which seems like a short amount, but there's a lot in there. So starting with 25, um, I like reading mine out of the New Living Translation. Um, or we can also use um, the NIV, whatever people have or like, that's what it is. Um, so in 25, it starts off with, therefore I tell you, do not worry about life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. So, we see in 25 how it starts off with, therefore, I tell you. So, if something starts with a therefore or because of this, um, it means it's referring to something else. Anybody want to take a guess at what is this is referring to? Anybody? 
in the New Learning Translation, it says, that is why I tell you not to worry. So what's the that? The that is what comes before it. So reflecting back on what we did last week, um, talking about money and treasures, the verse before it in 24 um, says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So it seems like it's talking about two different things because one thing's telling you not to worry. The other thing is saying you can't serve God and money. But they're, kind of, they're connected because he's saying you can't serve God and money. You can't be consumed by both things. Either you're going to be devoted to the one and neglecting the other or devoted to the other and neglecting the one. So he's saying, when you put things in your proper perspective, this is why I'm telling you not to worry about everyday things. Because when your perspectives are correct and you're taking that proper view, then it's giving you the right stance to see things from the correct angle. So that's how the two are are connected. It starts off with the no one can serve the two masters. Um, the two key words that stick out to me um, in that is serve um, and worry. So with serve, like we talked about last week, serve means to um, kind of like be at the ready for the purpose of another. So if you think about like a waiter in a restaurant, like a good waiter or waitress, you know, if they see that glass is empty, boom, they're at it. You know, you don't have to look for them. You don't have to flag them down. I don't have no silverware, um, stuff like that. Um, so, but they're serving, they're being at the ready of the one that they're serving. Um, it's also in servants, like in older times and unfortunately in some places today where people are servants to other people and not just like hired servants but sometimes in a way where they are not treated fairly or are slaves to another person but if they're a servant or a slave because of their position they have an obligation to obey so it's not about doing what they want it's about doing what their master wants um, kind of like the way that a dog has a master and like when a dog has a master, the dog wants to please its master. And, it, you know, I'm not saying that about slavery, but <laughs> I'm just saying as far as servants and masters. Um, when something is a master, it has control over the other thing that it's being the, the servants is to. And so if we're serving God, God is our master. But if we're serving money, money is our master. And so if we're becoming a slave or a servant to money, not working to have money, but working for money, working so that we can accumulate it, so we can gather it, so we can have it, <laughs> not just, you know, for our life's need, but as a preoccupation, that's when it becomes in the wrong. And that's one of the main things that can kind of lead to anxiety is when we take things out of their proper perspective, out of their proper place, um, we don't have our focus right, we don't have our priority straight, we can start to serve those things, like money. Um, and then when those things become our master, it's insatiable, meaning it's never satisfied. No matter how much money anybody has, they're never like, all right, I'm good. You might think like, I have enough to retire, I might have to buy what I want. Um, but it's just part of that human nature to never get enough, to never have enough, to never want enough. Some people think, oh, if I just had a million dollars, but a million dollars doesn't go that far as it used to. And then once you factor in helping all your friends and your family and getting the house that you want, getting it upgraded the way you wanted it, getting the cars you want. And all the people who would show up once they know you had a million dollars. Yeah. That million dollars is probably going to be much less. Um, but one of the things that stuck out to me when I was reading this is that money in this verse that it's talking about is not an object, it's a concept. And the concept 
behind it is that you have something of value. So whether that money um, is a euro or a dollar or a yen, the thing with money is when you have it, you know you have something that other people want. Um, one thing that all stores have in common, I was thinking about you know, with Black Friday coming, no matter what store you go into, no matter what they're selling, they all have one thing in common. They want what you have. <laughs> so when you walk in the door, you are the most important person, you are the most special person, because they think that they can get what they want from you. Not because they really care about you, um, but because they want what you have. And so people knowing that, you know, people who have money, knowing that they have what other people want, um, it's, a, it's a power play. And the real thing of it is control, because when you have money, it gives you more options. And not just to, you know, buy red sneakers or blue sneakers, but it lets you be in certain positions that you might not be without that. So if you walked into a store and you look like you didn't have money, they might not treat you as good as somebody who looks like they have a lot of money. And it's not that your personal value has changed, but it's how you're perceived. Um, the same thing with like some politicians or not to hit on politicians, but people in places of authority. If they have friends with money, they can put those friends in certain places so that way their friends will give them that money. <laughs> to certain troubles, they can try to get out of it because of the money that they have. So it's a power thing um, and it's a control thing. And trying to control that and have all that power, it's consuming. Um, it doesn't just consume your life um, or your time, but your spirit your emotions, your thoughts. Some of the most unhappiest people are the most wealthiest. And it's not because money is wrong, but it's because they're serving money. They're worshiping it. They're not just working for it. They're working for the concept of it. That concept of power, that concept of control, that concept of self, um, rather than pleasing God. So I think that's how the two verses kind of tied together um, where God is saying, well, Jesus was speaking here and he was like, you know, you can't serve both. You can have both. Like we talked about before, you can have God, you can have money, but you can't serve God and money. You can serve God with your money, but you can never serve, you know, God and money at the same time, because it's not just a service, but one is going to be your master. And if your master is not God, your priorities are out of whack and that's going to set you right up for anxiety. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, no. And also our online people, you can comment and then um, we'll probably start answering questions that people post like once a month. You guys can help us in some too. All right. So that's um, kind of an introduction. Um, and then Alan had something for the 20. Yeah, so, so, so getting started um, with verse 25, um, it says, uh, Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And then it goes on to say, is not your life more than food and your body more than clothing? And uh, the, the pretty much the emphasis, and this is, it might not be clear depending on what translation you have, but some, some Bibles don't have the words of Christ in red, but this is Jesus talking. And he's pretty much, he's telling the people, you know, don't be anxious for anything. You know, and it's not that it's wrong to desire food or drink. I mean, those things are going to sustain your body. And to have clothing to cover your body. I mean, we're in the New England area and like tomorrow's high. Thanksgiving Day's high is going to be like 22 degrees. So it's good to have some clothing or layers of clothing to keep yourself warm. But, you know, he's saying, don't worry about these things. 
and he's like saying, isn't your life more than just food? Now, consider that with Thanksgiving coming tomorrow. Not that that's anything wrong with eating food, but when you're consumed with the appetites that you you have and, and just wanting things and, and being consumed with trying to attain or gain these things, this is what he's speaking about. He's saying, isn't your, your life more than just food? And isn't your body more than just clothing? He's saying, be anxious for nothing. And the scripture uh, that came to my mind was uh, Philippians uh, 4, 6 through 7, where it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Excuse me. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understandings, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. And again, he's saying your life. And uh, one of the things uh, I had gotten from, from reading that is your, your life is more than the things you worry about. And it's not that, like we, we have children, we desire to have a roof over their head and have food for them to eat and clothes on their back. But we understand that if we make our requests known to God, God will provide all of our needs. We might not have all of the things that we desire and we want, but we'll make it. And, and this is, I believe, the focus of, of here. Just make God aware of the things you need. And he already knows. Jesus knows. He lived on this earth. He walked among us. He, he you know, the, when he broke his 40-day fast, I'm sure he was absolutely starving. And, and he's been cold, he's been hot, he's been hungry, he's been thirsty, so he can empathize with us and, and relate with us, but yet he still urges us and tells us not to be anxious about these things. He understands we have rent and bills to pay and the holidays are coming up and you wanna you know, have a nice spread on your table come tomorrow evening, but he's still saying, in urging us not to be anxious, not to worry, to put our faith and trust in Him. Anything you want to add? To... Um, no, just like one of the things that you were saying, I think um, a lot of times that we get caught up with worries that are of our own making. So I think, you know, like with Thanksgiving per se, there's a lot of tradition involved, there's a lot of expectations. Um, it's kind of a lot of people pleasing, I think. Um, not that it's wrong to want to, like, you know, give your family and friends a good time and have great food. Who doesn't like that? But I think that there's so much emphasis put on things being of a certain status, of, you know, a certain appearance. Like, if you're at Thanksgiving and you don't have mac and cheese, although I know mac and cheese is a thing. But if you have 19 things to eat before you, no one there is going to go hungry. But because mac and cheese is expected, it has to be good mac and cheese, you know, it has to be the way grandma made it. Like, people put a lot of emphasis and stress and worry, you know, into things that really don't matter, you know. Um, and that verse just reminds me of that, like, you know, if you have food to eat and you, you know, you have, you have enough. Like, not to be worried and consumed about, you know, those things that really don't matter because your life is more than that. Yeah, if you, if you <clears throat> get together and eat cereal together, I mean, at least the family, they're alive, they're well, they're healthy, they have the ability to come together and enjoy each other's company. It's a day off of work for, for some of you. I know, you know, some people still do have to work, especially those in retail. Um... But the emphasis often becomes on things that are really not as important. We tend to focus on those and devalue the other things which are more meaningful. Uh, so moving on to 26. And again, this is the King James Version. He says, this is Jesus, again, this is Jesus talking. He says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? So he's making a statement and then asking a question. And I never thought about this. Like we have, you know, a lot of squirrels uh, where we live. And I don't know, for the past month to six weeks back, you've seen them scurrying across the road, burying nuts and 
just all over the yard. You've probably seen them dead in the roads because they just they're just everywhere. But birds don't do this. Birds. I don't know the life of a bird, but I imagine birds get up in the morning, they go, they eat their worms and bugs and go about their day, then return back to their nest and go back and do the same thing the next day. And it's saying what Jesus is saying here, your heavenly father feeds them. He's saying God cares about the birds and God provides for the birds. Then he also asks the questions, are you not more valuable than they are? So God values you far more than all the birds on the earth and all the birds that have ever existed. So how much more is he gonna take care of you and provide you with home? A home, food, clothing, a place to live. God will sustain you and will take care of you. And a verse that I thought of while really reading this was Philippians 4, uh, 19. And this is from the King James Version. It says, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And one, one of the things, oh, I, I've already mentioned it, one, one of my points I wanted to mention, you are more valuable to God than all the birds in the world. So if the birds can go about life just kind of carefree, not that we need to have no cares, but we should be mindful that we have a God that, ha that is looking out for us and he owns everything. So whatever we need, it's not too much to ask him. And to, to make our requests or our concerns or the things that we feel we need and don't have, we can let God know and make him aware of that and stand confident in knowing that he's able to provide it. Anything you would add for 26? Um, I don't think so. Anyone have any thoughts for 26? Have you ever thought about that, about the birds? Have you ever thought about the birds? Like, if you don't have a bird feeder, who feeds them? Yeah. The birds that are in the wild. You don't see them stacking up worms. You never see birds planting and water yeah. and stuff. There are no birds with gardens. But they don't have any money. <laughs> but they're always taken care of. So moving on to uh, 27. Um, it says, which of you, by worrying, can add a cubic to your stature? And some of them say add an hour. Uh, some of the translations of the scripture say add an hour to your life. At a cubic, it's which which of you can make yourself taller by worrying and thinking about it? And one of the thoughts I wrote down, what does worry actually change? You think of your situations, you think of the things that you worry or stress about. What does your worry and stress actually change regarding your situation? It doesn't make you any money. It, it doesn't make you any healthier. If anything, it can make you sicker because stress can you know does a lot of uh, bad things to the body but ultimately you know given what jesus is saying you know i've, I've kind of come to the conclusion that worrying about things is more of a distraction than anything else because the time we we're spent worrying and focusing on what we don't have and what we lack or what we're not is, is keeping us from really just trusting God and looking at what he has already provided and given us. I mean, you, again, to, on tomorrow, you might not have all the things you want to eat, but you'll have something to eat. You'll have a roof over your head. And, and, and with that in mind, let's keep in mind those who are homeless and, and who, who don't have, who aren't as blessed as we are, who don't have tons of family members to come around us and, you know, encourage us and uplift us and, and, and share recipes with, and some people don't have that. So let's, let's keep them in mind. But when we worry, when we find ourselves consumed with just worry and thoughts of, of fear, let's be reminded of these scriptures and Jesus encouraging us not to worry. 
And again, really think about what does worry actually change? How does it change your situation? And a scripture I thought of when reading this was uh, Luke uh, chapter 10, verse 40 through 42. And this is the New King James Version. Um, it says, But Martha was distracted with, with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me, left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which, which will not be taken away from her. And this ties into Thanksgiving is tomorrow, Martha was trying to, which I'm sure Jesus appreciated, you know, the house being clean and food being prepared, but she was consumed with serving and having things to perfection. And she was so consumed with trying to do this, Jesus is in the house, but rather than sitting at his feet and just listening to the, his teachings and the things he had to say and just enjoying his company, She's focused on trying to make everything perfect for him. So much so that he says to him, she says to him, Lord, don't you see me doing all this stuff? All these things? You see how busy I am? Don't you see my sister just sitting there beside you? Tell her to get up and help me. And he was like, you have a lot of, you have a lot of worries and troubles. But Mary has chosen the good part. And what, what is the good part? The good part for Mary was she saw that Jesus is here. She's just going to sit at his feet and take in whatever he has to say. His teachings, just, just be around him, just be near him, just be in his presence. And, and not to be like Martha, overly um, consumed and taken over with the responsibilities of life and the things that have to be done. And this is, I think this is where... This is probably where a lot of people are at, and I think this has been all of us at some point, where we're just so distracted by what's going on that we lose sight of what's really important, and we lose focus of Christ. Like, we, we think of the amount of bills we have to pay. We, we You know, your oil bill and electric bill are going to be higher this time of year. Um, snow on the ground and ice, so you'll need shovels and snow blowers and rock salt and all these different things. But let's not be so distracted by these things that we lose sight of what, of what is um, really important. Anything you want to add to that, 27? Um, no, but I did want to ask a question. Um, because it's, it's good to read this, and I think that you brought up a lot of great points that are valid. But let's get some interaction. Because... These things are in the Bible for a reason, and they're there for us. So, if he's saying don't worry, it's kind of implying that we're already doing it, or prone to doing it, or it's going to happen at some point. So, everybody, think of something that you worry about. Because everyone has something. So, in like the last week or the last day, something that's been kind of on your mind, something that you would like to change or wish was different or something that takes over your thoughts or keeps interrupting <clears throat> your other things that you're doing that you've been having on your mind well I can go first to help maybe <laughs> encourage them to to share but just having a job I mean those of you who are watching this now or will see this in the future don't know that we have a lot of children and I was recently laid off in July, but it's maybe the third, fourth, or fifth time I've been laid off. But one of the things that comes to my mind is how will we, you know, when we have rent, how will we pay rent? Now that we have a mortgage, how can we, how are we going to pay our bills? How are we going to put food on the table, clothes on the kids' back? Kids are constantly growing. How will I make sure they have the things that they need? And one of the ways that, that I've learned to just kind of let go of that and trust God 
is prayer, being open, being honest, and also looking back of where God has brought us from and that the other times I was laid off, it wasn't, wasn't the end of life. You know, I've been laid off. We've had to, we've gotten rid of cable and haven't missed it since. You know, you do things, you cut back in certain areas to save money and, and you really start to look at your money and, and where it's, where it's going. And when you have to look at it, it helps you be more, you're less likely to spend it foolishly. Um, so looking back at what God has done and how he's provided for us and taken care of us and blessed us and always provided another job, um, that's what helps me to not, you know, not, not stay in that place too long. I mean, it does come like in waves, you know, especially when you've looked for a job and you've applied and you're not hearing anything back, you're not getting any emails back, you're not getting any calls. Or when you go on interviews and they just, you know, nothing turns up, they like you, everything goes well, but you don't get an offer. But just know that God is with you the same way he's provided and taken care of us. He, God is no respecter of person. He loves each of his children. And he's a good father to all of his children. And he, he'll provide for all of his children the way he provided for us. Does anyone else have anything, something you worry about? No one's going to make fun of you. School. Does anyone worry about school and good grades? I worry about my grades sometimes. And so, with the things that you worry about, everybody has something. You can take it, put it in your mind, write it on a piece of paper, whatever it is. That one thing, just pick one, there's a list, but pick one thing that you worry about. And then think about, if you worried all day and all night, for weeks and months and years, how would that change that situation? It wouldn't. It wouldn't? But if you worried like really hard, but if you stayed up and you thought about it and you lost sleep, what if you were so worried that you couldn't even eat? Then what would it change? <laughs> yes, you might lose some weight, but worrying is not going to change the situation that you were worrying about. So it's really kind of um, an exercise in futility, meaning it's something that you do, but for no beneficial purpose. So it's not that, you know, life doesn't give us challenges or that, you know, worries don't come to our head, they come to all of our heads. But when they do, it's important to realize it, stop it. And by stopping it, I don't mean like, just be like, oh, don't worry, because that's, not how this works but i mean to acknowledge it to be like this is constantly on my mind this is something that's a movie that keeps replaying and i know how it ends because the situation hasn't come yet but because i'm so worried about it i'm trying to carry that thing um but i can't move it's kind of trying to carry a weight to a place that doesn't have a destination and you're just walking and it's just weighing you down and you're just walking and you're walking and there's no place to put it because there's nothing that worrying can do to fix it. So when we trust in God, that's like giving him our, our burdens. We're giving him that stone, that weight. So when you find yourself worrying and replaying the same things in your mind, when I say stop it, I don't mean like to be like, oh, just don't do it anymore, that didn't happen. But to be like, whoa, catch it. Be aware of it. Confess it. Be like, ah. Oh, I'm worrying about this again. And then when you catch yourself doing it, give him that rock. Give him that boulder and that weight. Put it down. Let your shoulders drop. Breathe. Seek God, and then he can direct you to what it is that you should do. Um, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understandings. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. So we don't have to know all the answers because if we're trusting in him to direct our steps, he's going to make the path the right way. And if we go astray from where he would have us to go, 
he's so good and so powerful that he can recalculate and put us back on track even though we went the wrong way. So it's kind of, that's how it ties in again to the money thing, trying to serve God and money, trying to serve self, trying to have that control. Like I said, money is not a thing, it's a concept. It's trying to have that control and serve those desires rather than serving God, rather than trusting him, rather than letting him be the master, letting us be the servants, following where he would have us to lead. Yeah, well, one of the scriptures, <clears throat> I didn't mean to gloss over it, but that is Philipp Philippians 4, 6, and 7, but 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that's one of the things with being laid off so many times, um, just for different reasons. Companies can't raise funds, moving overseas, moving to different areas, or whatever reason. Um, God will give you a peace, which, you know, and it says, which surpasses all understanding, because it doesn't make sense for you to have peace and be laid off and still have a family and bills and children. It's like, what do you mean you have a peace and you, you, you trust God? Like, but you don't just start there. And it's, I think it is easier for some people to get there than others. But like, like was, what was mentioned uh, by Tori was to, to give things to God and allow him to take things from you and, and work to get to that place where you surrender, surrender things to him and you do have a peace about your situation and circumstances. And one thing she mentioned about the GPS and recalculating, it doesn't matter where you end up, God can recalculate and put you back on the path he has. Because again, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills. He owns, he owns everything. All the resources that you could think of, they belong to him. So if you are somewhere, you might think you're, you're too far gone, you're too far out of the way, God will build a road to get you to where he has you to be. He can build a bridge, a tunnel, and whatever. Or he'll uh, warp you to where you need to be. Uh, one of the things I'm thinking of, I heard uh, Mark Driscoll say it, about being in a place and God like redeeming the time. And he's saying you're doing things that should take, you know, just make up something he said like five years and you're doing it in a year. And he says that's because you're in the wind of the Holy Spirit. And it's being in a place where God is just blessing your efforts in the things you do. So that doesn't really, that's a little off topic from this, but it's just something I felt, felt to, to bring up and to mention. So like the, we were mentioning with, um, you mentioned grades, or some people might be peer pressure, or might be trying to fit in, or fix a broken relationship. Um, whatever that thing is that you're worried about. And now you realize that worrying is not going to help it, but there is help for it. And there is help for our worry about it. So what we need to do, or what you can try to do and start practicing, is when you catch yourself, when you realize that you're worrying, catch yourself and be like, I'm worrying. And then be like, address it. God, I'm concerned about this. I'm, you know, he knows our thoughts. So why are we trying to impress him by acting like we don't have troubles? You know, he knows our thoughts before we think them. And so if we're here thinking them, trying to act like we didn't think them, even though he knows. Like, who are we really fooling? Not him. Um, but uh, catch it, address it, acknowledge it, and then bring it to him. And like you were saying with the grades or, you know, whatever anyone else's worrying is, let him direct you because he can give you a plan on how to fix it. Maybe you can fix that broken relationship, but it's not saying one more thing or sending one more text or making one more phone call or telling one more friend about the situation and not addressing it with the person that's really the problem. Maybe it's to apologize. Maybe it's to be quiet for once. Maybe it's to let them talk. Maybe it's to buy them something. Not to say you can fix all your problems with money, but I'm saying let him direct your steps. Don't put all the pressure and all the weight of having to fix it on you. Let God lead you. But you have to give him the keys in order for him to drive. Yeah, like, like was, what was just mentioned, uh, catch it, 
uh, and address it. Um, what was the last thing? Yeah, catch it, address it. Does anyone remember? No? Uh, catch it, address it, but one other thing is, you know, set, give it to God. That was the other thing. But leave it there. We tend to, um, we'll catch things, we'll address things, we'll give it to God, but then we'll pick it back up. Um, we, I think as, as a people, at, sometimes we just, it's hard to just really let go. And that's, that's what God desires, because once we truly let go, then He can operate and get in the mix and, and, and just work, work it out. But if we're constantly, you know, He's trying to fill in the hole, but we, we won't put down the shovel, it's like we have to put the shovel down and leave it down and allow God to do, you know, what, what He desires to do. Anybody have any questions or any thoughts, comments? Worrying doesn't help. Yeah. Who do you think wants us to worry? The devil. Why? <laughs> Why would the devil want us to worry? Because we more focus on worrying about what your situation is than like wondering if God can help you with it. Excellent. That's exactly. Because if we're so worried about it, then we're taking that control. We're not seeking God, but we're so worried about it that we're not letting God help us with it. So it's like our troubles are causing more troubles. And those troubles are making the troubles worse. And the devil is the only one who's, who's making out because he's happy that we're not doing what God would have us to do. God's not happy. That we're spending so much time worrying, we're not talking with him. We're not happy that we're spending so much time worrying, knowing that it's not even going to help. So that's that's a great point that you brought up. You can't serve the two masters. Especially yes. the devil. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have any comments or thoughts that they wanted to share or questions? The problems are kind of like songs. <laughs> it talks like a song. Um, they don't choose who their master is. They get, mm -hmm. they, you purchase them for like a few dollars. Mm -hmm. You keep them for however long you want. You choose when to feed them. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I never thought of it that way, Janelle. Yeah. You can also true. sell them if you no longer want them. They want a better home. That's true. And also, not everybody's nice to their dog. I know. People should be nice to your dogs. People be nice to your dogs. All your animals. But, yeah. That's, <laughs> that is true. All right. Well, um, we can close out. And maybe if you could, like, pray for, like, like your worries and anxieties. and uh, So next week, we'll pick up. Uh, Matthew 6 uh, starting at 28 and we'll see how far we get then um, Father God we just thank you for this lesson uh, thank you for this day we just pray that people who hear this either now or in the future would just get the things out of it that you would have them to get out of it but also help us all to not just be hearers of the word as the scriptures say but to be doers also and, and not to uh, gloss over because people do have legitimate you know issues and concerns and things going on but we pray that you would help us to get to the place where you would have us to be which is totally free from from anxiety and worry especially this time of year a lot of people just have just just keep this extra stress on themselves i mean life is difficult enough without constant worry but we pray that people would just learn to to, to submit and to give things to you and to stay in your word so they know how to surrender and give things to you. I mean, in this, you know, Matthew 6, Jesus is, is talking. He's, give, he's giving different analogies. He's mentioning uh, the birds, how, you know, the birds don't store up anything. They're, they just, what they need each day is provided to them by God. Help us to have that same confidence in God to know that, He's going to provide whatever it is we need and help us to, to 
define the word need and to and to not not get it confused with wants and desires and not to look at what other people have or don't have and be driven and consumed by that but to just be balanced but help people to surrender and to give this 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 anxiety which is such a burden on some people it causes them not to be able to sleep at night not not able to focus and it just causes problems in relationships and and it's just like a habitual pattern and cycle i pray you would help people to to become free from this and to use that time to do what you would have them to do to focus their efforts on what you would have them to focus it on and to 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 be a new person and to also not to just be a new person for the sake of being a new person but to also help other people who are struggling with anxiety and worry and fear to help them to get to the place where they surrender and yield that to you as well and it's and to be mindful that it's it's the race isn't given to the swift but it's those who endure to the end that these things might take some time but to to be patient to trust in you and to to be honest and to accurately assess ourselves and our situation and our lives and to give things and surrender things to you and we thank you and we love you in jesus name amen, amen.